Welcome everyone to the Intel Builders webinar program, and thank you for taking the time to join us today for our presentation titled, Designing Elastic Storage Architectures, Leveraging Distributed NVMe. Before we get started today, I wanted to point out some of the features of our BrightTalk tool. There's a questions tab on your screen. I encourage our live audience to please type in your questions at any time during the presentation. Our presenters will hold off on answering those questions at the end of their presentation. On your viewing screen, you'll also find an attachments tab with some additional documentations and reference materials, and take a look at that at the end. Finally, at the end of the presentation, please take the time to provide some feedback using the rating tab. We really do value your thoughts, and we'll use the information to improve our future webinars. Today, we are pleased to welcome Josh Goldenhar and Yaniv Romim from Accelero. Yaniv, uh, is the CTO and co-founder. He's been a technology evangelist at disruptive startups for a better part of 20 years. His passions are in the domains of high-performance distributed computing, storage, databases, and networking. Yaniva has been a founder at several startups, including Accelero, Zero Round, and Ticketel. He has served as CTO and VP of Engineering. Josh Goldenhar is the VP of Products. He has worked on product strategy and vision at leading storage companies for over two decades. His experience puts him in a unique position to understand the needs of our customers. Prior to joining Accelero, Josh was responsible for product strategy and management at EMC, Extreme IO, and Data Direct Networks. Previous to that, his experience and passion was in large-scale systems architecture and administration with companies such as Cisco Systems. He's been a technology leader in Linux, Unix, and other OSs for over 20 years. Josh holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and cognitive science from the University of California in San Diego. Welcome, Josh and Yoniv, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Deborah. Josh, you bet. All right. Well. Um... Thanks everybody who's who's joining, and we're real excited to talk to you today uh, in conjunction with uh, Intel. And um, we'll go ahead and tell you just a little bit about uh, Accelero. So if you've been watching any news about us or, or take a peek, uh, we're very excited to be have named the uh, 2017 Product of the Year by Storage Magazine. So um, very happy to uh, to see that we're we're being recognized out there. And um, We'll talk a little bit about what Accelero is and, and what we're seeing in the marketplace. So this shouldn't be news to anybody really that uh, elastic storage is enabled by what's going on in the industry and specifically elastic storage on standard servers. So scale out applications, that is um, things that are being deployed today at very large scale, uh, are optimized for elastic storage. That is, is they scale themselves and they really need something that can go ahead and scale along with them. Um, NVMe, uh, in, 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 a, in a very large part led by Intel, uh, has really taken the storage industry by storm. Um, the NVMe Media and the drives themselves offer a level of performance that's just never been seen before. They, uh, they really have latency and throughput characteristics that basically blow any other media out of the water. Um, they're getting to be very dense. Uh, they continue to evolve, but they have actually presented a unique problem in that uh, they are so performant that if you load up a, a single machine with multiple drives, you can't actually take advantage of all the performance that they provide. That is, um, you can put a, a bunch in a machine and you get a whole bunch of capacity, but you can't use all the throughput. You can't use um, the, all the IOPS. And so you're left with um, a significant investment of a very high performance device, but it's trapped inside a single server. And so you'd really like to be able to, to, uh, to use that and share that. And hence we have the last point here, which is server SAN or SAN functionality implemented on top of standard servers. So when you take standard servers with NVMe and you put an intelligent soft layer, uh, software layer on top of that, you can get maximum utilization of this high performance flash uh, over standard networks. So the other side of this is, is we're finally at the point where you don't have to have fiber channel to have a SAN or SAN-like functionality. You can really get the best uh, of all these worlds together. You can get extremely high performance at low latency. You can scale out. You can use standard servers to save on cost. 
Um, but there's no trade-off for performance here. You're going to get very, very high performance. So these enablers have all uh, come together to enable what we call elastic storage. And um, of course, the best one that we're going to talk about is uh, Accelero NVMesh. So Accelero NVMesh stands for a non-volatile uh, mesh. And it is a way to take uh, this very high performance NVMe uh, media. And instead of it being trapped on a single server, it allows you to pool all these NVMe resources across multiple servers. And you can do that in, in various different methods. Um, it's software defined. So NVMesh is software that runs on top of standard Intel servers. And it pools these drives utilizing either NVMe over fabrics or our, uh, our RDDA protocol to basically take all these distinct devices and make it act and behave like a SAN. The difference being though, unlike traditional SANs, you don't have to use fiber channel. You can just use regular ethernet. You can use InfiniBand if you like, but ethernet works just fine. Um, you get a completely distributed model that has, of course, a GUI, but also a RESTful programmatic interface. And it gives you logical volumes, data protection with multipathing. You can use uh, dr multiple drives across different hosts, and you can have drives and host failures. And of course, uh, just like a real SAN, um, it supports multi-attached LUNs. That is, you can have the same logical devices, or LUNs if you like, attached to multiple hosts. And this is very handy for clustered file systems, uh, such as leading file systems out there, or even something like uh, Oracle's ASM. Now, lastly, this, this all sounds great, um, but, and, uh, but what is it when we say it's a, it's a server SAN? Well, fear not, it's not something that you have to change your applications for. Uh, it works just like a SAN. We pool drives. In the bottom of this chart, you can see we take standard servers um, with NVMe drives. We can use a fabric like Ethernet, um, running, of course, Linux here. We put our drivers on top of Linux. Uh, our driver to the host presents itself like a block device. It looks, walks, and talks like a local block device. Uh, and it acts just like a local NVMe drive. That is, you get the same latencies and the same performance. However, you're actually offering up logical volumes. And those logical volumes can span multiple hosts and be attached to multiple initiators. And now lastly, on top of those logical block volumes, you can put uh, your favorite local file system. You can put a shared par uh, parallel file system. And of course, your applications then sit on top. The key thing here is standard servers, standard media, standard networking, Linux, logical volumes, standard file systems, and lastly, your applications uh, unchanged. So you can get the performance of local NVMe and all the benefits of a SAN. And with that, I'm going to hand off a more detailed explanation to my colleague, uh, our co-founder and CEO, excuse me, uh, <laughs> CTO, uh, Yaniv Ramem. Yaniv? Thank you, Josh. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move a little bit more into the, onto the technical side of, of how we get things done. Um, just give you a little taste of what we're doing. Um, when we look at our software, um, so, so like Josh said, our, our solution is really a software-only solution. You can deploy it on any hardware that you like. Um, and it, it generates the SAN by working in three different planes, in the management plane, the control plane, and the data plane. Um, our solution is, is, is predominantly very performant and very scalable. And the way we achieve that is by making each one of these, our functionality, each one of these different planes also be very performant and very functional. Um, I'm going to start from the, from the top down. Um, on the management side, our solution is based off a um, web serving, web serving um, solution, something I a solution or a solution based called Node.js. And, um, and it uses a MongoDB database underneath. What that allows us to do is it allows us to scale out our management just like you would scale out a scale out application. So just as we are catering to serve scale out applications where they have flexible needs and we want to be able to provide any level of performance from small to large on a linear basis, our management does the same. And in that way, we can manage a small cluster of nodes. Um, of, we can target maybe something as small as even just five or 10 nodes within a cluster. You know, we can climb all the way up to hundreds or perhaps or potentially thousands of nodes within a single environment by just adding on additional management pieces. Um, what the management does from a functionality perspective is exactly what you would expect from a SAN solution. It provisions volumes across the system. Um, it monitors the system. It does all the different configuration tasks. Um, 
So it's just like a typical management um, solution, but it is a scalable one. Um, it provides a, a GUI interface, which makes it very easy to control for smaller um, environments, but it also provides a RESTful API so that you can programmatically um, perform all management tasks in a scalable way for a larger installation. Um, on the layer below that, we have our control plane. Um, the control plane is really the one that implements all the error handling that Josh mentioned before, overcoming um, network failures, drive failures, server failures, um, network disconnects, um, and any other kind of fault injection or fault fault that could happen within a within a live environment. Um, anything that can happen will happen as we know, um, and this is really what the control plane has been built to be able to manage. Um, to implement the control plane, um, we install a application on any node that has target devices on it, and what those node, what, the, what that piece of software does is it monitors um, the networking and the drives and communicates with the other with these other elements together, um, and they do what's called a joint or distributed decision making in order to be able to identify also if one of them one of these elements has failed. Um, we use a modern decision making or distributed decision making protocol in order to do that. Um, something called a RAP. We use something that's similar to a RAP protocol. Um, a RAP being um, RAST being a protocol that is used for for that kind of distributed decision making. Um, nodes can disappear, and with that, some elements within the decision-making process can disappear. Um, nodes can be added in dynamically. We can scale up or scale down the system, um, not only overcoming failure, but actually providing real elasticity. Um, and that's exactly what these um, control plane elements do. Um, they will communicate with the data plane implementers and tell them how to implement the data path on an ongoing basis to ensure that um, the system is live and it's providing consistent storage um, over time. Um, why is the system scalable as well? Using the RAP protocol, we can scale up to hundreds and potentially thousands of nodes as well, um, which makes, again, the control plane very, very um, scalable and strong in performance. Um, that user space application that implements this is not part of the data path, which means that we are able to um, also keep down our latencies and be performant. Um, moving over to the data plane at the bottom, um, this is really where the, the heavy lifting occurs. Um, the storage is implemented, and to do that in the most efficient fashion, um, we have two pieces of software, our client and our target piece of software. They are both um, kernel modules, which means that they are extremely efficient. Um, we don't have to do any complex transitions between kernel space and user space in order to implement standard I.O. Um, we work and we appear on the client side as a standard block device, meaning that you can, as Josh mentioned in the previous slide, you can put any kind of file system you want on top of it, be it a local file system such as an XFS um, or a distributed file system, and we've, we've worked with several different vendors to validate um, that our solution works for their distributed file system, or you could put a database on top, for instance, that knows how to work with raw block devices. Um, being a standard block device, means that the most efficient way of doing that is within a kernel module, and that's exactly what our client, um, that's exactly how our client is built. Um, on the target side, we also have a kernel module um, that may be in the data path, um, but its main, the kernel module's main purpose in life is to actually go and set up pathways between the client and the drives themselves. Um, the data path is made very efficient by using, um, among others, our RDDA protocol, which is, um, which is a mnemonic for remote direct drive access. Um, we have paid the technology with, with which we can actually have a client generate a request um, to read or write data um, from a remote drive. And um, through this, this, this technology, we're able to do that using a single RDMA write from the client, which will hit the drive directly and, um, and come back. I'll go into more detail on this on the following slides. Um, but just to give a hint of what RDDA is all about. Um, and then this is the layer that does the multipathing and does the data protection and, and generates the volume. Go into a little bit more detail. Um, we have on the top part of our slide, we have our GUI um, in our, in our um, management system in general with, with the RESTful API. Um, it's implemented, as mentioned, as a Node.js application using a MongoDB database underneath, which makes it extremely um, scalable and efficient. Um, on the left-hand side, we have, um, we're depicting a, a typical client. 
um, by an application. On, on the client, we have an application that consumes storage. Um, underneath that, within the kernel, we have our intelligent clock, client block device um, implementer. It can implement multiple block, block devices, and we can have the same block device shared among multiple clients. Um, the intelligence for ensuring um, that the data is always available and consistent, um, even when there are multiple clients um, um, interacting with the same volume, and even when um, we have multiple passes, if they change over time, um, if ones go up and down, all that is, is handled within the intelligent client block device. Data um, protection also occurs there, um, generating, if needed, multiple instances of data or um, forms of, of data protection um, from the client side directly to drive, which means that the system is very scalable um, because we do direct client to drive access. Um, we don't have any multiple, any instances of multiple network hops to go and um, implement the storage um, I.O. Everything is really um, kept to the minimum on the networking side so that things are efficient. Um, just as an example um, of why that is so beneficial, um, if, you, if you take and we'll show, and we've got some numbers later on that sort of prove this point, but um, if you take a local drive and you measure how much time it takes you to access the drive locally, on a typical SSD, you will see around 20 microseconds for writes and around 100 microseconds for reads. Um, when you access them remotely um, using our RDDA technology, you will get an overhead of around four microseconds, and that is with standard software. It does, or our work, our software works in a standard way. It's interrupt driven. It doesn't do any special polling on the hardware in order to get those, in order to get really low artificial latency numbers. These are latency numbers that you would put in a live production system and would be able to to enjoy them in a, in a system without uh, requiring any special CPU allocations. Um, it's all very, very, um, very um, low from a CPU perspective, um, from CPU usage perspective. So it's very efficient and you still get extremely low overhead. Um, when you start looking at more advanced technologies like um, the Intel Optane, um, we cross point based uh, solutions, um, you can see the value there, um, even more value there because again, even though the, the, the media is so efficient, it can bring you, um, you can read data um, at the at rates of, of, of sub 20 microseconds. Um, even when you use it across the network using, um, and we mentioned RDA, you still relate, remain under 20 microseconds, um, even for, for read access time. Um, on the right hand side, we have our target. And as I mentioned before, it's also a kernel module, and it does have a user space module for the control plane. Um, the kernel module sets up the networking pathways between the client and the drive, um, but it doesn't invoke any CPU usage um, in order to access the drives using the RDDA technology. What that essentially means is we send an RDMA write from the client all the way into the drive. When the drive finishes, an RDMA packet is sent back without invoking a single CPU cycle on the target. Um, Just to mention again, one of the things that is really um, unique about our architecture is we've chosen to implement storage services on the client side. Um, that means that we're doing something that is different than, than practically any other storage solution out there in the market today, where things tend to get done on the target side. When you start looking at scaling up in multiple um, elements interacting together, moving the services from the client side, um, sorry, from the target side into the client side, it's really what makes the system scalable. Um, it's not necessarily better or worse from a functional perspective. It's just different, but it does provide much more performance and scalability, which is why we've made this choice. Um, I've got a question here, which I which just came up now. Does our latency, does it matter if we're using Ethernet or Infinity Band? Um, and I should have probably mentioned this on a previous slide. Our product works over both Ethernet and Infinity Band, and we get the um, same latency, regardless of the access um, of the access net of the network used. Um, so we're we're strong supporters of both of these um, options, um, and um, it really depends on, on which market or which um, you know whichever network you want to use. Um, we're happy to cater for that. We do the same thing for servers. You can practically work with any server model you like. Um, we work with any NVMe device. Um, we have a, a hardware. Are an HDL, a hardware um, certified 
um, list of devices that we have tested with and verify that they work well with our solution. But um, honestly, today we, we have found that we work practically with any, any device um, on the market, any server, and we work with, with multiple facets or multiple makes of networking as well. So just a little bit more about how you can deploy our product. Um, within the storage world, there tend to be two types of philosophies of how to do, go and deploy storage within a network. And a lot of times it's an administrative um, question more than a technical one. Um, but there are, of course, technical justifications for one or the other as well. Um, from a, um, so on the right-hand side, we're depicting a disaggregated um, layout, one in which somebody or the administrator chose to have dedicated storage boxes. Um, and um, you know the other, and then below that we may have compute nodes. Um, in this in this layout, the storage elements and the compute elements are separated, um, and so you typically have a different administrator for each of them. Um, in this case, our solution would be installed. Um, the target side would be installed on the, on the servers at the top on the storage servers, and our client side functionality would be deployed on um, on the servers on the lower end. Um, and that, that allows separation of, of administrative um, responsibilities between the two sides. And um, this is useful, for instance, for, for environments in which there's a lot of volatility on the compute, and the compute um, is often rebooted or there are changes there, which is very efficient in those kind of environments. Um, on the left-hand side, we have what's called a converged environment. Um, it may be hyper-converged, it may be just simply converged and still um, used without hypervisors. Um, in this kind of setup, you have um, storage elements and VME drives or such um, within within the within the same nodes as um, you perform your compute. Um, and in this case, you would you would install our target um, service or target software and the client software across all the different nodes. Um, essentially, you're getting a a, a stand based solution that's not taking any use of um, rack space at all, um, and you're literally um, Using a converged solution, but you're getting disaggregated storage um, in a virtual or logical logical disaggregation um, mode. Um, the left hand side is more complicated from a management perspective or administration perspective because you do have to combine compute and storage. Um, but the benefit of it is you can get extremely high performance. Um, you literally have um, all the PCI lanes across your network available for you for storage, um, and you have um, all the networking from all the different nodes in order to communicate between your compute and your storage. And that really does provide the opportunity to get really, really high um, performance numbers. Um, we found, for instance, that HPC environments, um, where they are looking to get the, the most scalability and the most performance, tend to move towards, um, towards more um, converged environments. While on the right-hand side, um, certain enterprises or, um, or other of the customers that tend to be more conservative around um, deploying storage within their compute nodes tend to go towards more towards a disaggregated solution. Um, but from our perspective, our software caters to both of them. And in fact, what you could do is also is to, to actually do a hybrid solution, one in which you did some of your storage in a converged mode, and then you had some disaggregated storage servers to complement anything that would be missing from your system. What makes us unique? So I hope that at this point it's clear that first of all we are a 100% software solution that implements a server-based SAN, um, allowing you to go and use whichever hardware choices you or use a cho your choice of hardware um, and still get the benefits of, of cutting-edge um, performance and um, the very best, um, you know, a pri a primary tier um, or tier zero um, storage. Um, you can take your NVMe resources and pull them and use them in an elastic fashion, um, greatly increasing their utility. Um, you can continue to access them at extremely low latency. Um, as mentioned before, four to five microseconds overhead, regardless of whether you're using an infinity band or an Ethernet network in order to access um, drives remotely. Um, and that greatly increases the utility you can get out of these NVMe drives, and you can increase your efficiency rate and increasing the amount of, um, of utility you get out of each one of the drives. Um, by using or by not using CPU on the target side, we enable um, rolling this out in a converged way, um, which gives even greater utility or efficiency um, from the hardware. 
um, you get essentially a virtual um, distributed um, all flash array um, from a functionality perspective, and you can use it again both in a conversion and disaggregated way. Um, by choosing a client site um, implementation for storage services, we allow you to um, scale out and grow to very large scales and retain nearly 100% um, efficiencies. We have customers who have deployed across 128 servers, and they have seen nine, over 99% efficiency when they compare the utility they got locally from a single from a single drive or a couple of drives, and then compare it to what they got across 128 node network um, with the same number of drives in each node. Um, they were able to get the same amount. They were able to increase their latency, sorry, increase their um, bandwidth and their IOPS at a linear scale without increasing latency. words about what we did recently with Intel. Um, so within with Intel, we, we went we set out to show how well we could use an Intel um, P4600 device. Um, we ran measurements um, using NVMesh when accessing the drive remotely, and we're going to present the results for that. Um, and if you go and compare them to what you can get from the device locally, you will find that you will get um, the exact same results. Um, for the purposes of the test environment, we deployed a couple of um, super micro boxes. Um, the model is listed here. Um, we use low end Xeon devices because they are sufficient. Um, and because we're not using any target type CPU, we literally can use the minimal CPU there. Um, and also on the client side, we are, we are very efficient um, by running a kernel module um, to implement the storage services. So a low end um, CPU is also sufficient in this case. Um, we used the standard um, distribution of CentOS. Um, we employed a Mellanox NIC um, phase 5 running at 50 gigs, which is actually way overkill for what we're doing here, um, but it was, uh, was definitely sufficient. And we used um, standard FIO to perform the testing. Test results um, from an IOPS perspective are shown here. This is a 70 30 mix, meaning that 70% of the operations were read while 30% were right, um, 4K um, random I.O. Um, this is typically considered a standard workload and often used um, to measure devices. Um, and it, it really um, tests the system in a way that is realistic, um, in a way that is um, considered um, a good um, measure for, for various different applications. Um, what we show here is that already with a single thread, we can get almost 12,000 IOPS, meaning that our latency is extremely low with sub-100 microseconds on average, um, which again shows how efficient the RDDA is over the networking. Um, there's really very little difference between a between local and remote access here. And if one, one was to go and do the computation and compare it to what you know what you can get from a, from a local device, you would see that there was about a four microsecond overhead. Um, and as we increase the number of, of IOs, um, number of outstanding IOs all the way up to 256, um, we were able to max out and really reach the maximum performance of the device. Um, almost 400,000 IOPS out of a single device is, um, is obviously um, a very, very high number. Um, and it just shows the strength of the Intel device, um, but also shows the strength that we can actually um, provide that performance um, with ease over a network as well. One of the things that we have found is customers that in many ways is often more important then the IOPS number itself is the consistency of the of the latency. Um, what many what many applications what many um, sorry what many web scalers have found is that as they go and they scale out their system, um, they become dependent upon a wide variety of devices, and they're actually um, impeded more than anything else by tail end latencies and by latencies being inconsistent. And so what they want to see is that they want to they, they are able to get. Um, deterministic I.O. Um, what we've shown here is that even when working at the very highest levels, at that 375K IOPS level, um, the variability of, um, of the I.O. level and the variability of latency also is very low. It's up 2% here um, from a standard deviation perspective, um, which again shows how well you can use such a device even over a network. And with this, I'm going, to, I'm going to pass back to Josh, who will um, walk you through some um, examples of use cases and customers that we have. Thanks, Genevieve. 
Um, before we do that, I, I just want to do follow up on, on one detailed question that came in. You, you answered part of it. Uh, thank you very much. Which was um, the question was what was the latency numbers for random access? So it was as shown in that um, those charts. Uh, our latency for accessing devices over the network is extremely low. Uh, it's it's five microseconds uh, of additional latency over whatever the drive can do for reads. And depending on whether or not you pick a logical volume that is protected or not protected, the access can also be five microseconds to ten or twelve microseconds uh, for writes. So so really. Uh, what this means is you're going to stay sub 100 microseconds for reads, and your writes, depending on the device, uh, can be in the, the 25 to 30 microsecond range. So extremely low latency. Uh, and then the last part of that question was, does physical distance have an impact on latency? And um, yeah, as much as we'd like to, we cannot change the laws of physics. So uh, there are additional uh, latencies added for, for additionally uh, every switch hop. You're going to get about another microsecond for every switch hop. And I should stress that we are a LAN-based protocol. This is not really a WAN. Uh, so when we say we do mirroring or replication, that is locally on a LAN. It's not really a, a WAN-based protocol. So hopefully um, that, uh, that answers that question. So let's go ahead and into some of the uh, applications you can use for this. And uh, hyperscalers. Now, we, we said we patterned what we do after folks doing very, very large deployments. And um, that's, uh, that's also who we target. So uh, imagine you are a hyperscaler uh, or just a very large um, web and cloud style customer, or you want to be like a very large web and, and cloud customer, but you can't afford to hire thousands or hundreds or tens of thousands of developers. So you can take our software and you can scale out. Um, you can go ahead and, and pool NVMe drives and use this uh, as a pool where you get very, very high efficiency on your usage. This is great for artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, operational analytics. Uh, you can go ahead and, and look at tons and tons of data. Uh, databases, of course, we've had a very large success with uh, very, very large Oracle databases as well as much smaller you know, things like uh, MySQL, uh, in-memory databases, Cassandra, Aerospike, um, uh, Spark, Apache, so Spark that is. Uh, containers and orchestration. Um, we are great for containers uh, with orchestration layers because we can give you a persistent storage layer that performs at the speed of local flash. But yet, unlike local flash, it doesn't tie the container to physical hardware. And of course, that's the whole idea of containers, is to be able to move these loads around freely. Um, lastly, uh, real-time analytics, both uh, data and things like video analytics. And, um, and lastly, uh, intrusion detection. So that is, again, a, another real-time use case. Uh, you can go ahead and look at network patterns and try to see if someone's breaking into your network. Uh, very, very low latencies and very high bandwidths enable you to examine lots and lots of data uh, in real time. Now, if you're not uh, a hyperscaler, I did mention this, uh, high performance for databases. Uh, please go ahead and look for uh, another talk that we had recently with a partner named CMA. And um, a very large databases perform extremely well. Uh, you can use, again, standard servers, standard NVMe. Uh, we, of course, suggest the, the Intel NVMe drives um, to give you an extremely scalable, low latency, high bandwidth, high performance uh, database storage platform. Customer successes we've had. Uh, we're very proud that we announced at this last uh, NAB show uh, that Technicolor uh, is a customer. So um, Technicolor completed work, post-production work, and color correction uh, using our product on a, a very recent, uh, very big movie, and we're very, very proud of that. Um, basically, we're enabling Technicolor to have multiple editors working on film at the same time without copying the data back and forth from centralized storage. So what we actually fixed for Technicolor was their workflow problem. Uh, to understand that, you have to know that on, on the movies these days at 4K resolutions or above, we're talking lots and lots of big files. Um, we're talking high bandwidth needs, but also low latency so that the editors can actually see their changes immediately and have a more natural feel. So generally to do this, folks copy data onto their workstations. And you can think of other use cases even if you don't do video. Uh, they copy all the data locally to the machine. They work on it and then they copy it back. 
And of course, while it's copying back and forth, this takes a lot of time, and you don't actually have a shared namespace. So what we enabled Technicolor to do was preserve their workflows by using their existing clustered file system. And editors from their workstations did not have to copy any data. They just simply used the files on the central uh, file storage just like they normally would. When they were done, they could simply knock on the wall of their neighbor and say, hey, okay, I'm done. Uh, no time spent copying back and forth. So we really help them preserve workflows um, and uh, get their work done much faster. Uh, we're also very proud uh, in a totally different use case uh, to be part of uh, the newest and fastest Canadian supercomputer from a consortium called Sinet. This is uh, hosted by the University of Toronto. And uh, under Sinet, with Intel drives, uh, we gave them what's known as a burst buffer. This is, uh, for their compute cluster, uh, an area of storage underneath their spectrum scale or GPFS file system. Um, they have a, a, a pool of storage that can burst writes at very, very high bandwidth. Uh, this is uh, mirrored writes at over 80 gigabytes per second. They can get read performance of above 140 gigabytes per second. And um, if they, uh, they can actually scale this up to over 250 gigabytes per second. Um, if, uh, if they care to do some reconfiguration. And, and that really is the key here, is that uh, we are a software layer. It is configurable programmatically. So you can take all these drives and make any kind of volume you want. So Synet is enjoying very, very high write performance, extremely high read performance, and uh, tens of millions of random read 4K IOPS so that they can have a bandwidth load, and then they can immediately switch to a, a very high IOP, uh, low latency intensive work case. They don't have to change the media or copy data around. Uh, lastly, I did mention uh, Oracle. We have our partner uh, named CMA, uh, who uh, also did a webinar with us. So you can go ahead and look for that. And um, they like to say that they're running Oracle faster than Oracle does. So uh, CMA takes uh, standard Oracle. They are a licensed or, uh, Oracle reseller. And uh, they take Oracle and um, their own servers and either in a hosted fashion or can do consulting, um, support very large databases, uh, databases approaching 150 terabytes with individual tables as large as 20 terabytes. And uh, with their specialized knowledge combined with Accelero and vMesh, they get a storage layer that is the highest performing they've seen, uh, doing full table index scans faster than any product uh, in the history that they have ever evaluated. So I'm um, very happy to be partner with CMA. And if you have large Oracle databases and are having uh, under Oracle Rack and are having issues um, with performance, we definitely think that um, Excel or NVMesh and or CMA uh, can help you out there. So at this point, I believe we'll move to questions. Yes, we do have some questions. Will you be supporting management with the Swordfish spec? Uh, so I will take that one. Um, we are watching Swordfish uh, actively, uh, waiting to see if it does get a little bit more adoption. It's very good to have a standard out there, um, but we're not necessarily seeing it really adopted. Uh, for instance, when we go into OpenStack environments and whatnot, people want to use Cinder. Um, so uh, we do have a RESTful interface, and the way that we have been able to adapt to container environments, to OpenStack, uh, et cetera, is that we can add a patch layer that goes in between um, whoever standard uh, they want implemented um, to our RESTful interface. So um, we absolutely can, and uh, assuming adoption comes with Swordfish, that we'll go ahead and support the, the Swordfish standard. It's just simply not supported quite yet. Do you support target side offload? to drives and CMB to do direct I.O. between NIC to bypass server memory? Uh, yeah, I'll take that one, um, Cindy. Um, we are actually currently working with vendors who are coming out with CMB on their drives. Um, we're excited about the, about the option of doing that because that will um, even increase the efficiency of our system by not having to work with any, any memory. We'll actually be able to work directly over um, PCI um, using only pure PCI to PCI um, connectivity to interact from a client all the way into a drive. So absolutely. 
Okay, are you using ROCE v2 for your network protocol over UDP, or are you configuring PFC and QoS for your traffic for multi-use tenant case? We provide, um, as I mentioned before, two networking options, um, the primary being Rocky v2, um, and then there's the infinity band um, option as well. Um, when we, we use Rocky v2, um, as we're coming in onto somebody else's network, so we don't directly configure the network, we use what's available there. Um, our recommendation is to make the network um, RDMA or Rocky um, proof. There are several ways of doing that. Um, one of them is using PSC and adding in quality of service, um, as mentioned. Um, there are additional options, such as using ECN um, or a combination of PSC and ECN, which provides um, even more scalability and um, is being used in some of the larger RDMA facilities um, to provide the best um, networking solution um, for, for Rocky in general. Can NVMe mesh, or I'm sorry, NVM mesh only be used with P4600? So, as we uh, Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, uh, uh, no. The, the answer is we can use basically any NVMe drive. So this is not limited at all to, um, uh, to Intel. Um, we do like the performance, uh, reliability, and stability of the Intel devices. Uh, however, we can be used with essentially any NVMe drive. And Yaniv mentioned this earlier. Um, for people that are interested, we do have a, a hardware certification list that um, we're always happy to share to say which drives we have tested with. Do you have compatibility list of hardware that your software will work with, or will it work with any RDMA NIC? Uh, Ash, actually, as I kind of uh, ended up saying before, um, we do have a, a hardware compatibility list as well as a software compatibility list, and um, that does uh, basically detail all the NICs we work with. Um, It'll work uh, when, when when the question is, will it work with any RDMA NIC? Um, it won't work with any NIC, but there are not a lot out there, so it will work with the major players. And uh, of course, we're, we're very much hoping that Intel is going to be joining those players soon with a um, a, a production RDMA NIC. So um, so we can work uh, with various RDMA NICs, and that is an RHCL. How does the system scale? It scales very well. Thank you. So, <laughs> um, no, the uh, uh, the system starts with a minimum of three nodes. Uh, we actually suggest four, but you can start with as little as three nodes if you want a system uh, with mirrored redundancy. And you can scale the system by simply adding as little as one node at a time, or as little as one drive at a time. So uh, you don't have to um, you don't have to add entire appliances and full of drives. Um, we allow you to add individual drives, individual servers. Best practices may say that you should add two servers at a time. For example, if you're doing rated volumes, uh, RAID 1 that is, or RAID 10. Um, however, you can start with as, uh, adding as little as one server and as, a, uh, as small as one drive at a time. And that can scale up to uh, 1,024 hosts in our current version. So today you can actually make a, a logical volume um, that is already into the, the, the petabytes uh, of size. So scalability is, is not an issue for our, our system. How many SSDs can I put in each server? Uh, again, uh, we, we QA um, up to limits today of, of 24 drives per server because most of the servers um, don't hold more than 24 drives due to the fact that they run out of PCIe lanes. Uh, off the processors to feed these boxes. However, this is not a technological limit at all. It's simply a QA limit. And um, we can go, uh, the PCIe bus is spec'd to be able to support up to 256 devices. So that would not be uh, an NV mesh limit. That would be a PCIe uh, NVMe limit up to 256 um, uh, drives per host in, in one PCIe root complex. Does the system support SAS or SATA SSDs? Uh, this the system does. We so um, our largest benefit, as Yaniv really detailed out, 
uh, is using NVMe. And that's because when we use NVMe, uh, we can completely offload the target side processor. And um, that's a really big benefit if you want to run in a converged way. When we use SAS or SATA drives, uh, the same cannot be said. With uh, SAS or SATA, uh, the, the driver is going to be running on the CPU on the target side. So the more IOPS or more IO load that you drive, the higher you're going to use uh, the utilization of that CPU on the target side. So we can use SAS and SATA, but you get the best benefit from running with NVMe. And our last question is, is there any support planned for 3D Crosspoint? Uh, very happy to say that um, we don't have to plan it. 3D Crosspoint works out of the box. So if you're using the Intel Optane drives, uh, we actually can get remote read and write access to those drives in as little as 14 microseconds. So um, 3D Crosspoint in the Optane uh, drive is, is already supported because that's an NVMe device. We've tested with it. And if you have that extreme latency need, uh, you can go ahead and use that out of the box today. All right, that wraps up our questions and answer uh, portion of the presentation today. Thank you, Josh and Yaniv, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. Be sure and provide feedback about today's webinar and check out the schedule for upcoming webinars that you can sign up for. Thanks again for joining us today, and thank you again.